Okay, my name is Colin Lees and it's a huge pleasure for me to be able to be here. I'm not Leo's oldest friend, but I think I must be very close to the oldest of his friends, which doesn't mean I haven't known him for a long time. I just calculated I've known him for 41 years and I very much uh, responded to what Brian said about us all being Leo's students. And all I wish is that it had been 20 years sooner uh, that I began to be his student. It would have been difficult because he would have been 10. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet I would have had a lot to learn from him about how to grow up. Uh, and uh, I, do, I do regret that. Maybe I'll get a chance to say more, but uh, it would be easy for me to use up the first half of this talking about what I've learned from Leo and uh, the fun I've had with it, so I won't do that. Might get another chance to tease him a little bit later, but we'll see. Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce this panel, consisting as it does of eminent scholar activists uh, of the kind that Leo has always attracted around him and inspired. Uh, <coughs> I'll quickly say who they are and then they can talk one by one. Um, <coughs> Frances Fox Piven is probably known to everybody here by her work. Uh, <coughs> she is a retired professor now from uh, <coughs> the Graduate Center at City University in New York. Uh, she's known for her work on social theory and social activism, and of course famously with her late husband, Richard Cloward, she worked, <coughs> wrote an article back in the 60s on <coughs> in the, the nation entitled The Weight of the Poor, a Strategy to End Poverty, advocating increased enrollment in social welfare programs in order to collapse the system and force reforms leading to whatever, a, gu a guaranteed annual income. And coming from Queens, I have to say that I think Kingston was the first uh, uh, municipality in Canada to declare itself in favor of the guaranteed natural uh, a guaranteed uh, <coughs> national income. So it's all very, very prescient, and no doubt she'll reflect on the way that's come full circle in some ways. So let's begin with Frank. Oh, I am really so pleased to be here, uh, thrilled to be here. I've known Leo a long time, and I have to say I love him uh, totally. He is such a warm, dear friend, and he's very smart besides. Now, I've known Leo since 1974. I don't think Leo remembers this, but there was a conference at Columbia University, and Leo, who must have been about 24 years old or so, Leo gave a talk in which he announced, pronounced, that the economic was determining in the last instance. <laughs> Does anybody remember that slogan? Uh, so I'm glad to be here. I'm glad I get the chance to deliver these remarks, which were prepared with my colleague, Lori, just because I get to talk about Leo too. Uh, but what we, our work, Lori's and my work, uh, that's reflected in these remarks is about American political parties and their relationship to protest movements in the United States. Uh, we particularly want to talk about the contemporary Democratic Party. Now, uh, a kind of preliminary uh, version of this talk is being published, I think, this week in, in these times. But we do intend to go on and do more work on it because we think that the contemporary party structure in the United States is A, very complicated, and B, not fully understood, and C, extremely important and disheartening, disheartening. So, but that's not where we want to begin. Where we want to begin is to remark upon an incredible thing that is happening in the United States, even as we speak. 
I've never seen anything like this in all my many, many years. And that is that all sorts of people that I would call activists, from the center to the left, are flocking into the Democratic Party. And this is an, an incredible thing. And it's, in a certain way, it's easy to understand why they are alarmed, shocked, taken aback, stunned by Donald Trump and his craziness and his antics and the menace that he poses with his allies <coughs> in the fossil fuel and financial industries. Uh, so it's partly to be explained by Trump shock. But listen, it's very big this flooding into the Democratic Party. Uh, and it may have longer and larger significance than just a reaction to the buffoon who is now the President of the United States. Think about how wide-ranging this focus on the Democrats and this eagerness to help them help them. Who ever wanted to help them? <laughs> uh, think about how wide-ranging it is. For example, there's a new network that formed largely over the internet, uh, I think precipitated by a Google Doc, called Indivisible. Mm -hmm. It includes many people who worked as staffers for professional political Democrats. And it just burst forward, burst out. And it's everywhere. Every little town uh, mm -hmm. has a chapter of Indivisible. Uh, or there's something else called Sister District. Sister District, uh, this is a little wacky to me, but <laughs> means that it's activists who are trying to shift the electoral tide in adjacent electoral districts. Or Clinton staffers uh, and Obama staffers have started something called Run for Something. You know, everybody should get on the ballot. And you know, a lot of people actually are getting on the ballot. Or there are older groups like Emily's List, a feminist uh, electorally organized uh, group, which is pro-choice. And or Our Revolution, which came out of the Sanders campaign, uh, has 400 local chapters, and they are focused on electoral politics, and necessarily, in the American electoral system, the Democratic Party or brand new Congress, which also came out of the Sanders campaign, or movement groups, which historically have tried to hew a separate path from electoral politics. Black Lives Matter is now involved in electoral politics for the Democrats, of course. Where else can you go in the United States? Uh, or Labor for Our Revolution, Justice Democrats. DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, has quintupled in size just in the last few months. And what are they all doing? They're working for the Democrats on the local, most local level. <coughs> or the Working Families Party, which is a very smart, hardworking group that's actually set out to be a third party and settled in as a caucus within the Democratic Party because of American electoral laws and practices. Or Obama for America, which came out of the Dean campaign. Or Move On. We could, this is, so what do we think about this? This is big. It's really big. What do we think of it? Well, it could be good in the elections of 2018, 2020. Uh, 
it, it, it would it will mean a shift toward the Democrats, particularly on the most local level. Uh, but it may have larger, longer run significance as well, restoring the Democratic Party to something like a center left party, and maybe buying time uh, to quote the title of Wolfgang Streak's uh, recent book, Buying Time, which in a way we need, because at least in the United <coughs> States, there's a lot of alarm and fear. And I think with, with good cause, uh, all the talk about optimism notwithstanding. So, but to, to assess all of this, we need to talk, I think, about the significance of party, political party, in politics in the United States, still the dominant nation in, on the globe. Uh, and um, what kind of social theory do we turn to to try to understand the significance of political party and the significance particularly of an American political party, which is not like the parliamentary parties of Europe? And to do that, well, we could turn to the great socialist theorists who talked a lot about political party. Lenin talked a lot about political party. Gramsci, Trotsky, Miliband. Our own Leo Panitch uh, has written a lot about political parties. And what is, it, what is the essence, I think, of this tradition as it characterizes the party. I think it thinks of the party as the mind of the movement, uh, the mind of the great proletarian movement. And that kind of conception won't do for an American political party. Because um, the American political parties and other parties in other countries as well, though not to the same extent as in the United States, are shaped not by the movement of which they are the mind or the leaders, but American political parties are shaped by electoral competition. They are competing. They are organisms that have evolved to compete for control of the state, the capitalist state. They are shaped by what Ralph Milband called electoralism or constitutionalism. And they are embedded in the state. Not only do they reflect the state structure, because they are competing for offices on all levels of this complicated federal structure. So they take on the same kind of organization as the state itself, but they are then molded by state laws and state regulations. This is a very distinctive kind of animal. Gramsci can't tell you about this animal. Uh, they, so they're embedded in the state and in state law and procedure. The incentives for this are huge. They're competing to control this massive, powerful state apparatus. And Donald Trump actually won the leadership in the last significant election to control that apparatus. But th think also about the way in which this party structure in the United <coughs> States is as a consequence of its symbiotic relationship to the state is deeply fragmented in the last several campaigns, for example, there's an enormous amount of rupture tension between the national campaigns, the Obama campaigns, and state and local party structures. Because they're competing for different offices with different constituencies. They have different incumbent, uh, incumbents to protect. And they do not mesh easily. There is, for example, a common 
uh, complaint among Democratic Party activists that uh, the low state and local parties don't work on voter turnout in big elections. Of course they don't work on voter turnout in big elections because winning and holding seats on the state and local level depends on a stable and small electorate. The, so, so it's a complicated and tension-filled structure that all of these activists all over the country are flooding in to take over. The, and moreover, this is also a structure that bears the powerful markings of centuries of resistance to democracy. I mean, that's why Trump won. Uh, the Electoral College is not just an accident. The Electoral College is the product of the early history of the American Republic and the efforts to, the efforts by property owners to resist democratic demands. The legacy of resistance to democracy, which is reflected not only in the Electoral College, but in a limited franchise, a very limited franchise for a modern country. And it's also reflected in the widespread use of the gerrymander, which even as we speak is being considered by the Supreme Court, is extreme partisanship in gerrymandering constitutional. What kind of a country has to have a court deliberation to decide the answer to that question? Uh, so, Crazy. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, the uh, peculiarities of representation in the American system, uh, which <coughs> give uh, states like Alaska, which don't have any people, as much representation in the Senate as states like California or New York. And then there's the flood of money, unlimited now in the United States, is the role of incumbency. What? Dark money. Dark money. Dark money, especially fossil fuel money. Uh, uh, all of which points to the limits on the electoral party in the United States into which these tens of thousands of activists are flooded their limits as instruments of social transformation. So, maybe, or to some extent, it's a little more complicated, we think, than that. Uh, but to appreciate the complexity, I think we have to step back and look for a moment at the role of movements uh, which I have always thought were very, very important in shaping <coughs> American politics. The, it, it's reasonable to think of movements and <coughs> electoral parties as having very different dynamics, because they do most of the time. What do movement leaders try to do? Well, movement leaders are insurrectionary movements in the uh, grand socialist tradition. Movement leaders try to identify the issues which tear populations apart, which divide people, which create conflict, uh, where everybody knows that the leader of a political party running for elections tries to patch together winning majorities to win those elections. So they are very, they have very, very different dynamics. And that's one of the reasons that the operatives of uh, party campaigns tend to scorn and scold movement leaders uh, whenever they have the opportunity. But they also, there also is another side to the relationship between movements and political parties. And that is that 
movements when they're growing can benefit if they share a constituency with the elected party or the party running for electoral domination because that will lead elected politicians to rhetorically at least champion the issues of the movement. We've all seen this happen uh, at moments when movements are emerging. Uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, for example, champions the issues of the civil rights movement. Or FDR seems to champion <coughs> the issues of the labor movement. And they do this because they're trying to win an election. And the movement has had some traction. It's formed a constituency. But, and also, as the movement grows, if it does grow, and it becomes more and more just divisive and di disruptive, it's going to be elected politicians who carry the movement demands through the political process to some kind of fruition, whether victory or defeat. So there's a sense in which movements and electoral parties have a complementary <coughs> relationship as well as an antagonistic one. And in that sense, the rush to join the Democratic <coughs> Party is perhaps a, a good thing, a positive thing. It can be a morale booster for political movements in the United States. But I think that uh, we have to end by saying that we live in a very uncertain moment, and we have to take advantage of whatever opportunities seem to emerge from political processes that are not the result of our deliberate intervention or are only partly the result of our political intervention. We did not, we on the sort of socialist left, did not call for everybody in the United States on the left of center to join the Democratic Party. That's what people are doing however. And therefore, in a period of great uncertainty, I think it behooves us to pay attention and to be <coughs> responsive to what ordinary people are doing because we can't make those things happen just by ourselves. We're not big enough, we're not strong enough, we're not energetic enough. And remember that even though there's so much talk about end times, and even though it's surely going to get warmer and dirtier and wetter, it probably is not the end. We should stick around to fight it out. And not because we believe necessarily in optimism, but because A, we have no choice, and B, what are you going to do? <laughs> and because the, it's a matter of character. It's not a matter of uh, having a happy vision of things. It's not happy. It's grim. And you could get grimmer. But determination, character, political commitment, means that we keep working at it. And that's my kind of optimism, at least. <laughs> <laughs>